Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Rabchuk. Uh, I've been invited by God's grace uh, to serve the message today from John. Well, it was my choice about the message, but or the passage. But uh, Pastor Ron invited me to come and share God's word with you. Um, it's great privilege for me to study the word uh, in order to prepare a message and serve you. I hope that uh, you will be blessed at least as partly as much as I was in preparing it. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, if you don't know me, some of, uh, many of you I know, although not necessarily by name. Don't test me on the names, <laughs> but your faces I all know. Um, maybe 50% on the names, but uh, uh, many of you don't know me. Uh, so <clears throat> I came to UBF in 1986. Um, I was, at the time, I was teaching high school, uh, and actually, I was teaching high school, but in a sense, illegally, because I didn't have a certificate. Um, <clears throat> so I was brought in as a permanent substitute uh, to teach Russian uh, at Prospect High School out in the northwest suburbs. And so uh, the school uh, encouraged me to go ahead and become legal as a teacher by uh, getting my teaching certificate at UIC. And when I was there, uh, a very nervous man invited me to study the Bible. <laughs> it was John Bird. Uh, and he, uh, th that's one thing indelibly uh, scratched on my memory. He wrote down my name and his hand was shaking so <laughs> terribly. Um, I agreed to study the Bible with him, uh, but then I was going to forget about it, but he called me the night before, and he uh, encouraged me to come, and I said, oh, shoot, all right, I guess I'll go. Um, and I have to say that the, that first Bible study, we studied John's Gospel, and um, uh, I've shared this story a number of times. It's just amazing to me. We, we studied John chapter 1 on the incarnation of Jesus, and uh, I, I'm a physicist, my background and a scientist, I didn't really have, uh, um, there's, I can't say there was one word in the passage that we studied that really made an impact on me at the time. I argued, you know, every good Bible student should argue at least for the first year. <laughs> uh, that's important. Uh, anyway, so I argued, uh, but then at the end of our study, we finished and John said, uh, why don't you pray? And I said, I don't know how to pray. Um, and he said, well, just thank God. So I did, and I also said, and uh, God, if you're there, let me know. <laughs> and so I was uh, living out in the suburbs, and so I got on to the, uh, the L at the time uh, to go back to my car. And uh, as I got onto the L, I had this amazing uh, sense as I walked, I guess I, as I walked to the L and then I got onto it, I had this amazing sense, this is what I've been looking for. I felt so like I'd been looking for freedom uh, and for what could satisfy my soul. And, uh, I, and I, I used those words, I hadn't studied them yet, but I used those words that I, it fed, uh, it made me uh, like this is the food and drink I was looking for, I was so thirsty. <clears throat> So I believe that even though I knew nothing, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, came and anointed me and gave me one conviction. I need to study God's word. And so um, I, I have. And by God's grace, uh, I'm, I'm able to do so today. And so this is part of uh, that privilege. Uh, so since then, there are a lot of stories to tell afterward, but um, uh, I've been working at Western Illinois University for uh, 23 years now. Um, I am a professor of physics uh, and also an assistant dean. Uh, now we've moved up. We were down in Macomb. Uh, that's where I met Cheryl Kramarczyk uh, and uh, Tim McKeithran. Briefly, he came and left uh, <laughs> like a flash in the pan. But thankfully, he came to Chicago and he settled down. Um, but uh, uh, then we moved up, four years ago, we moved up to uh, the Quad Cities, which is uh, just straight west of here on I-80 uh, at the Mississippi River. It's a beautiful place, actually. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so we serve on a, a campus. It's right on the river. Uh, and I teach physics there. And I'm 
do the administration. Um, and by God's grace, um, I can share uh, fellowship with you all here. Uh, today, by the way, uh, my wife Jennifer and my son Isaiah came and visited, so they're there. Uh, <laughs> um, I heard that, uh, you know, if, so I came in UBF in, in 86. I was here in Chicago. We were here in Chicago through 19, 1996 is when I got the position down at WIU. Um, and so um, for 10 years, we're up here. And I was part of the vocal team. And, and I heard that the vocal team is coming back together again <laughs> today. So, and they're gonna sing an oldie but goodie, uh, mansion builder. <laughs> so, uh, this is like a, a, a reunion of the, you know, the 60s rock band is <laughs> coming back. Uh, so they're gonna sing the oldie but goodie, but hopefully this is from our new album, is the message I'm gonna share. So the, you've studied, many of you have studied this passage many, many times, um, uh, but uh, I've been thinking about this verse a lot over, for many years, and so I'm grateful to be able to focus on this verse. So the title of my message is The Work of God, and the key verse, we read the passage, the key verse is verse 29. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Uh, let's read that verse together. Let's go. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Uh, uh, we've already read the, the, we just read the verse again, but let's read it one more time. I think we really need to hear it, so let's try again. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Amen. Uh, when Pastor Ron asked me to share a message focusing on campus mission work here in Chicago, uh, this verse immediately came to mind. Uh, it's a verse that is amazing in its simplicity and directness. Yet at the same time, it is a verse that speaks to the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. And what is more, it speaks to the very heart of what it means to do Christian mission. We have all heard many, many ideas about what is God's work. And what isn't? Am I doing God's work? Are you? Who can say? Still, I can't help but think that all the explanations and all the opinions have somehow overlooked this verse. I'm sure there are any number of reasons why we don't necessarily take this verse quite seriously. We have to be mindful of the whole Bible. Uh, as Dr. Samuel Lee taught us, we have to pay attention to the chemistry of the Bible. We have to view each individual verse in relation to what the rest of the Bible says. So even though this verse is as plain as can be, and though Jesus explains quite thoroughly what he means, and though his message here is confirmed through his death and resurrection, and though it resonates throughout Paul's teaching on salvation by faith, and James' teaching on how faith and works go hand in hand, we are not altogether sure that it is okay for us to simply accept this verse at face value and trust that the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And also, if we were to take this verse seriously, we are not quite sure then what we should do. In my message to you today, I'm going to take this verse very seriously. And I will urge you to take this verse seriously and as fundamental to our faith and mission as well. I pray that as a result, your call to discipleship and to raising disciples will become clearer and most importantly, more fruitful, indeed bearing fruit that will last. I have no more authority than any of you, and perhaps in some people's eyes, far less authority than any of you. <laughs> That's okay. If I speak with any authority and conviction, may it be with the conviction of the Holy Spirit and with the authority of Christ Jesus, God's living word. Amen. The sixth chapter of John begins with the story of the miracle of the five loaves and two fish, in which Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000 men, plus women and children, 
with just the five loaves and two fish that his disciple Andrew brought to him. What is more, those disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of pieces left over after everyone had had their fill. History attests to the impact of this miraculous feeding of the crowd by the simple fact that it is the only miracle other than Jesus' death and resurrection that is recorded in all four Gospels. It was such a shocking event that it took the disciples and the crowd a fair amount of time to realize what had happened. When it dawned on the crowd what Jesus had done, they developed a plan to come and make Jesus king by force. But Jesus withdrew by himself up to the mountainside, and he set his disciples away across the lake, where he would later meet them. The crowd let the disciples go, we don't care about them, and waited for Jesus to follow. But Jesus, they never saw him come back down. The next day, they crossed the lake in some boats and came upon Jesus with his disciples in Capernaum. Rabbi! When did you get here? They asked. He had walked across the water at night, joining his disciples in the boat just before they reached the shore. But Jesus didn't explain that whole story. Instead, Jesus expressed disappointment. Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. How could Jesus be disappointed? I am not disappointed that you all came to hear my message. <laughs> By all means, come. More, get your friends, bring them in. <clears throat> How could Jesus be disappointed? A huge crowd had followed him for miles and were ready to acknowledge him as king. Wasn't this a great work of God? That's what the disciples thought. But Jesus rebuked the crowd for coming to him, not in faith, but in hunger. This point can be confusing because Jesus in, did indeed feed the crowd so that everyone was satisfied. But the people had misinterpreted Jesus' compassion and resulting miracle. They persisted in asking Jesus to feed them again. Perhaps they thought that by doing so, they were demonstrating their faith in Jesus. I believe you can feed me again, Jesus. I believe you can feed me every day for the rest of my life. What great faith. Maybe. But the faith that God will feed us is not faith in Jesus. Jesus himself proclaimed in Luke 12, 24, Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. The fact is, God has fed us and continues to feed us. If we consider the ravens, let's do that. Let's do what he says. If we consider the ravens, we see that they do work for their food in the sense that they don't stand around on the ground, look up, and open their mouths. <laughs> they fly around. They find dead carcasses to feed on. Yum. And they fight with other ravens over their food. We live in a world where we work for our food, which has been graciously and abundantly provided by the God of life. It is not faith to say to God or to his son, feed me. It is faith to say, as Jesus said when he broke the loaves before giving the pieces to the crowd, thanks. It seems clear from the crowd's persistent requests of Jesus to feed them that they were fixed in their idea about what it means to have faith. And we shouldn't be too smug as we consider their behavior. For this is our persistent struggle as well. As Jesus said, each day has enough trouble of its own. We are hard pressed to live in this world, and we long for the day when our toil in this world is done. 
We look forward to earning our chance to rest in retirement, to travel the world. But our challenges to live each day in the world don't disappear when we retire. My mom and dad did their best to save up for their retirement and then enjoy an idyllic life in southern Oregon. That's like paradise, isn't it, Pastor Ron? <laughs> Beautiful place. My dad said 250 growing days a year. He loved to garden. But my dad was overcome by depression and committed suicide after only a few years in paradise. And the nest egg that they had saved up very carefully was eaten up and destroyed because of greedy men who caused several market crashes that wiped out their savings. Theirs is not the only story like that. My mom is tough. She's now 93, almost 94. But she is often beset by terror at how she is going to live. Recently, she has come to the realization that God has provided all she needed, and she has found some peace. Truthfully, God provides. But his provision says nothing about our faith. His provision is a testament to his goodness, which is poured out on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. So if we shouldn't come to Jesus to be fed, for what should we come to him? Look at verse 27. Do not, let's read that together. Is it up there? Yeah. Uh, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Amen. Our daily bread is one thing, but the food that endures to eternal life is something else altogether. Where are we going to get that? Sometimes it seems as though, through technology, we could make food that lasts forever, like Twinkies <laughs> or thousand-year-old eggs, duck eggs. But yuck. <laughs> I don't think, ultimately, we, life on Twinkies would not be life. <laughs> Jesus tells the crowd plainly that the only way we can get food that endures to eternal life is through him, because he is the one on whom God the Father has placed his seal of approval. In our relationship with God, daily bread is a given for which we must give thanks. But God has designated that it is only through his Son, Jesus Christ, that we have access to the food that endures to eternal life. The crowd heard Jesus tell them, work for food that endures to eternal life. So they asked the logical question, what must we do to do the works God requires? Look at our key verse, verse 29. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. This verse is so simple as to be nearly impossible to understand. How can the work of God be to believe in the one he has sent? The crowd tried to make sense of it by returning to their original request. What sign then will you give so that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. It was logical. What better way to get us to believe in him as the one who provides the bread from heaven than by providing us with bread here on earth, as Moses had done for the Israelites in the wilderness. But Jesus had already fed the crowd of 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. They weren't looking for a sign. They were looking for a permanent handout. That is not the work of God. That is not the faith in Jesus that brings food that leads to eternal life. In verses 32 through 33, Jesus used the crowd's desire for bread to point them to the true bread that comes from heaven and gives life to the world. So the people said, sir, always give us this bread. 
Look at verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I have told you, you have seen me, and yet still you do not believe. With this promise, Jesus explained clearly what he meant by his teaching. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. The work of God is to come to Jesus as the bread of life. It is to come to him in faith and eat and drink the food that endures to eternal life. As he promised further in verse 40, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus had already given the signs they needed to believe that his promises were true. He fed the crowd of 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. But Jesus made it clear that a greater sign was to be given in God's time. For the bread that gives eternal life is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who gave his life for the sin of the world. In verse 51, he proclaims, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. When we look to Jesus in faith as the sacrifice provided by God to take away our sin, we have done the work that God requires of us. And Jesus, having reconciled us to God by his death, will raise us up as God's children for eternal life. As Christians, this we believe. Amen? Amen. Amen. And yet, when it comes to speaking about the work of God, or about doing the, doing the work of God, this is not typically what we say. Why is it so hard to take Jesus at his word here and trust that the work of God is to believe him as the one God has sent? Honestly, I'm asking. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm not sure it's important to know the answer. We all have our reasons. What I think is most important is to think seriously, meditate on what it means for us to just believe what Jesus is saying here. First of all, Jesus equates faith with work. That is very hard to understand. But this is not the only place where he does so. For example, in John 8, Jesus taught the Jews who believed him, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hold to my teaching, the work of God. In John 14, Jesus told his disciples, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and will show myself to them. And Peter proclaimed to the Jews at Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The work of God that bears fruit for eternal life is to believe in Jesus, holding on to his words of promise and command, if we do so, then the Spirit of Jesus and of God is with us. As Paul says in Romans 8, 11, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. The hard work that we must continue doing from now until the day of our death is to believe in Jesus as God's Son. But it is not a work that accomplishes anything from a worldly perspective. There's no, like I'm taking an online course, and every week they get a weekly checklist. Okay, I did this, I turned in that, I did that, I did that. Okay, good. Next week, what do I do? <laughs> 
This is different. There's no checklist. All the things that we do in an attempt to do God's work, all good things, such as faith, faithful daily bread, testimony writing, Bible study, Bible teaching, Bible preaching, and works of mercy and compassion, all of it is somehow beside the point. The focus of all our efforts, all our strivings, should be to look at Jesus, come to Jesus, believe in Jesus. The spirit of Jesus will do the rest, both in us and through us. We must resist the urge to consider this laziness or dereliction of our spiritual duty. Let us believe Jesus' words that the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Amen? Amen. Amen. If we do this work faithfully, we will bear fruit that lasts and enjoy the food that endures to eternal life. Secondly, this verse lays out a clear path for obeying the world mission command. In John 15, Jesus compares his disciples to branches, while he is the vine and God the Father is the gardener. He challenged them to remain in him, because apart from him, they could do nothing. But if they remained in him, and he in them, they would be empowered in their lives to bear much fruit for God's glory. And what is that fruit? According to the world mission command, it is disciples of Jesus, those who can do the work of God after us. I hope you can see already where I'm going with this. A disciple of Jesus is not one who can move mountains, prophetically teach, suffer hardship, or sacrificially give. A disciple of Jesus is one who loves Jesus and believes in him. 1 Corinthians 13. And the best way to raise disciples like that not WWE world wrestlers, but disciples who love Jesus. The best way to raise disciples like that is to love Jesus and believe in him ourselves. When we do the work of God as Jesus teaches us in this passage, we are making a dwelling place for his spirit in this darkened world. What a beautiful thing to work on. And when his spirit dwells among us, we are truly more than conquerors. In short, we obey the world mission command when we help others do the work of God by helping them come to Jesus and believing in him as the bread of life. And anyone can do that. How? By coming to Jesus and believing in him as the bread of life. That's it. Today I have challenged you and me to do the work of God by believing in Jesus as the one God has sent, to be the bread of life through his death on the cross for our sins and by his resurrection power as God's obedient son. The work is hard, harder than physics or chemistry. We are so easily fooled into working for food that spoils, trying to gain praise or other earthly rewards in our spiritual labor. But our labor to make our body a dwelling place for his spirit is not in vain. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Father, thank you for your son Jesus, for sending him to be the bread of life that whoever comes to him will never go hungry, and whoever believes in him will never be thirsty. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus gave us a clear direction. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Father, may we dedicate our lives to making a dwelling place for your spirit in this world, in our bodies, in our communities, uh, and in this world. 
Father, thank you for the privilege to uh, meditate on your word and to listen to it. May your spirit go out uh, and make it bear abundant fruit in all of us. Uh, and I thank you for this privilege. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's all rise. <laughs>